I guess I'll just start with a little bit of preliminary here. I'd like to keep this uh, open and conversational. If you guys have any questions, feel free to chime in. I know sometimes I tend to, it's like talking to my mom on the phone. It's like a freight train. It's kind of like it doesn't matter where you wanted to go. The tracks are already laid and that conversation is headed where it wants to. But don't feel that way. Feel free to raise your hand. Let me know. I'll wander a little bit, but with all apologies to the online audience, I'll try and keep it within the hash marks. I feel like I'm... It's like a face-off dot or I'm running a sideline here. But, um, uh, but what we'll do here is if anybody wants to, to chime in, go ahead. But uh, again, like I said, uh, secure and interoperable citizen services. I have this long sounding title here, Public Sector Director of Cybersecurity Strategy. But uh, from an introductory standpoint, what that really means uh, for those of you who know me, I travel a lot, I fly a lot, and basically what Oracle uses me to do is to go around to other similarly situated organizations like yourself. I only do public sector, I do all of North America, and basically I go around and steal good ideas. Because if somebody else in the public sector is out there, this is the beautiful part about working in public sector, we paid for it with our tax dollars, there's no such thing as plagiarism. So if somebody else is out there and they're doing something that is elegant enough, gets the job done, why reinvent the wheel? Uh, so we can always go and have a conversation about uh, why you may have idiosyncratic things that would differ from that plan or why you may need to tweak things a little bit, but the idea primarily is, is don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, a little bit of my background, uh, I actually do have a public sector background. Prior to coming to Oracle, uh, I was actually a felony prosecutor, um, but I also have a master's in computer science, I'm a CISSP, uh, so I can get technical, we can talk enterprise architecture, we can talk technical specs. We'll get into some of that. But most of the conversation we're going to have here today, I like to think of as being at layer eight of the OSI stack, which is the political layer, which for public sector is generally the hardest way to make some of these projects, especially when we're talking about projects of the complexity like identity federation and shared services. Uh, it's a pretty important layer and something we need to discuss there. So again, I don't get to see my house very often, certainly not this week, uh, but the idea is, is I'm out there meeting with people, your sister agencies, uh, both on the state and local side, as well as tribal and federal and so on and so forth in the US and Canada, and trying to basically solve the same problems and figure out if it works, let's just go ahead and steal that idea. So one of the things that I've come across in my travels is, is this, I like to put things in the context of what I call the four walls of public sector, and you're probably all very familiar with them. Uh, budget, charter, bench, and communication. So to illustrate, I think everybody understands what the challenges are with budget. Uh, you guys can feel good here in the room because if we go back for a, you know, like a three or five year sort of synopsis, you may have a, large it, uh, a larger uh, budget deficit than my home state, the state of Illinois, but per capita we're killing you. Uh, because we have nowhere near 12% of the US population, but we're running a close second in terms of budget deficits. Uh, I could tell you all sorts of interesting stories uh, if you wanted to go out and talk about this offline, about uh, interesting things and the way they run things in the state of Illinois. But I think we all understand what the pressure has become like for the budgetary perspective in terms of trying to get things going. There's no surprise there. And the problem with those budget challenges, and it's probably not too early for a Christmas reference, is it forces us to do things not the way we want to do it, but the best way that we can afford. Um, and I'm not kidding. Anybody been out in a store lately? It's not just Halloween stuff going up, right? The Halloween stuff is out in full force, but I'm already starting to see Christmas stuff. It's a cartoon this morning that's got a little manger display that has zombies in it. And they said, well, they didn't want me to buy them both at the same time. They got to expect this sort of thing to happen. <laughs> so that's kind of where we're at. Charter. Uh, Charter is not always the easiest one to explain, but uh, I'll give you an example where I've seen this in other states where you may have an agency that holds a large chunk of human identity for that particular state. And they may be in the best position to do things like authentication for citizens, for internal users, and that sort of stuff. But because we have a charter that's given to us by state legislature, you may be forced to say, it's not my job. 
you might have been the right person to clear the identity carcass out of the road before we painted it, but unfortunately, yeah, you know, my hands are tied. So I'm, I don't know if this rings a bell with anybody, but again, it's, it's an Illinois thing. It definitely rings true for me. <laughs> Your bench. How many people here, and I, I would expect this from, from what I've seen so far to be a large percentage of the people in the room, and in fact, I recognize a lot of you from, from previous conversations. How many people here state employees? Okay, keep your hands up. Of those of you that are state employees, how many of you only wear one hat in your job? <laughs> you took them down because you thought the question was over, but nobody here only wears one hat. And how many people got as the first hat? Their firefighter's hat, right? Because that's the sort of stuff that we have to deal with. Um, public sector only runs because of what I like to, I mean, there's no mistake that this guy looks particularly brawny here. Uh, public sector only runs because of what I like to call the hero team. Uh, if it wasn't for the basically people that take a hero's perspective to it from the public sector side, nothing would happen. We wouldn't keep the lights on. Federal government could take a clue there. So uh, I, I can take shots like that this week. And we'll talk about that a little bit later too. And communication. Um, so this again will be my own personal perspective on it from when I used to work on the public sector side. But when we used to have to communicate with other groups inside the state, whether it was Department of Corrections, Child Support Enforcement, somebody like that, it seemed like the way that we would talk about, well, we're going to need this on an ongoing basis. We need this data exchange. Well, we'll send you a flat file or go through an FTP. And granted, I'm dating myself a little bit here. This was back in the stone age of, of public sector. But you know, we used to be a pretty uh, backwards technologically set up organization to begin with. But the fact of the matter is, is it feels like you're talking through two tin cans with a piece of string. Unless you've really worked out a way to go ahead and figure out how are we going to do this communication, which is really at the root of some of the issues we're going to talk about here, um, then we kind of kludge these things, you know, there's chicken wire and duct tape, or some people refer to them as communications drug deals. It's not very easy to make these things happen. So that's part of the problem because nobody and this goes to charter a little bit, has been put in a position where they get to have teeth around it and say, thou shalt use this as a communication standard. If we're going to get on the same communication standard that's already established, it's generally because we do it voluntarily. We've decided that this is the right way to go about it. And that means for my organization, the organization, whether it's private sector, public sector, business partner, that means it has to be something that we agree to and it has to be a good fit for both of us. So where does that leave us? Uh, if you take those four walls into account, you get a nice little box is what's set up. And this is a, a term that I've liberated. That's another term for stealing from NASIO from a number of years back. Uh, anybody going to NASIO next week from the room here? OK. I was going to say, we can hang out and I can tell you all about Illinois. You feel much better. Uh, <laughs> but uh, cylinders of excellence, anybody know what I'm talking about? What fits into a box? Yep, silos. So we build silos. And, and that's how we used to do things. And a large portion of that that started to change, especially when we start talking about the budgetary perspective, is that we used to fund everything by projects. We'd have to keep it within those four walls, but we would fund the project. The project ended up being a silo, not because that's what we wanted to build, but because that's what fits inside those four walls most neatly. So the result was is that we got a lot of things that we never got to reuse. So we got data, we got accounts, identities, interfaces, uh, all sorts of things going across those wires, but they basically end up being a single-use sort of perspective, and then we really have to rethink the silo to go ahead and make that useful outside of it. If I could put this into a more sort of discussion perspective, if I could use a story with it, uh, anybody ever familiar with this, the ancient Tower of Babel story? You're about halfway up building the statewide portal when everybody suddenly realizes on the back end that we're all speaking different languages. And those different languages, how, how many people have ever gone on one of these large, multi-organizational or statewide portal initiatives? Trying to put a bunch of things in one place. We've got at least one person brave enough. And when, when does it break? Not, not if, when does it usually break? When the second system gets enrolled. Why? Because we architected for the first one. We set everything up for then. But now we all, all of a sudden have to realize that we didn't have it in the requirements, the designs, and the standards documentation, and the way we architected it to account for it. Now, it may be now that we're getting a little bit more sophisticated at that. People are able to get these sorts of things to stand up. But traditionally, Nirvana for state and local government used to be the statewide portal or the cross-agency portal. And these things would always fail the second we put the second one into place. That's part of the reason why. And I think we've learned a lot of lessons that'll help us solve this sort of problem. Now this one, again, I'll be dating myself with this one. Anybody know what this is? I'm sorry? No, nobody's going to get this, but I'm always amused by some of the answers. <laughs> That's a good one, too. 
this is what they refer to in Helena, Montana as a street gang. So over on the left, we've got our lookout. These two are doing a, it's not really a B and E, it's just like a smash and grab. He's checking, making sure the coast is clear. And I know it's a little bright, but it's a little bit dated example because uh, depending on how you feel about different types of government and legislature, the state of Montana only meets once every two years for their set session. And going back, this goes all the way back to like 2011, but I happened to be in town right when they opened session and there were two large parcels and we're talking, you know, nine figures, basically close to nine figures. Uh, that was, you've heard the term third rail political issue. It's a third rail, you don't touch it because y your career dies, right? Uh, normally, a lot of things that are earmarked for health and human services are considered third rail issues. And unlike California, and certainly unlike Illinois, Montana is not in a state of budgetary freefall. Okay? Montana has more millionaires per capita than any state in the union. They have tremendous mineral rights, uh, and they're doing quite well. Um, among the first five line items that I set in on when legislature met, they basically took almost nine figures that was earmarked for HHS and whacked it straight out of the budget. And one of the comments that was heard kind of off the cuff was one about perhaps there's a way to find this money from Uncle Sam. This is part of the reality that we're dealing with now, but it's not necessarily a problem. It's actually transitioned to how we get to the next phase. So what do I mean by this? I mean we're drowning in requirements right now. Because if we're going to go look to Uncle Sam, if we're going to go look to federal programs, if we're going to go look to initiatives and grants, there's a lot of things we have to comply with. So one of the things I'll, I'll go back to, and California wasn't uh, necessarily where I first got my experience with this, but how many people in the room from education? Anyone? Got a couple people, yeah, great. Familiar with SLEDs, SLEDs grants? State Longitudinal Data Systems. So for the people who aren't familiar with it in the room, the whole idea of a SLEDs grant was the idea of Federal Department of Education saying, we're gonna try something different in the way that we fund this federal program. Instead of just taking this amount of money and saying, here's the objective and fund another silo inside a project, what we'd really like to do is a longitudinal study on this that says if I fund these particular programs, so if it's an aftercare program or a Head Start program, this local educational agency or this one, I want to know what's going to give me healthy, effective, intelligent, tax-paying members of society and what's going to give me people that are unhealthy and people that may have problems with uh, corrections, maybe getting in trouble with the law or not performing well. Now, everybody knows in, in, in the education space in this room that one of the tricks to this, though, is that this is some of the most heavily regulated data we have in public sector. We're very paternalistic when it comes to especially student performance data. And what you're really asking for when you talk about a grant that, that approaches this sort of thing, and when you talk about this program, think about all the people that have to participate to give you a longitudinal answer. Labor, maybe? I know I got local education agencies. I have to have interaction with Federal Department of Education. Do I talk to corrections, health and human services? All these people are in there. So we have to figure out a way, when we talk about those two tin cans with a string in between them, we're talking about the mother of all communications projects here. Heavily regulated data, no money to really go ahead and do this, it's definitely not earmarked, but we're gonna start conditioning participating in new programs and conditioning participation in new grants on something like this. And this is just one example. I'll give you a couple other examples. But when you really talk about what that looks like, you're talking about N number of handoffs between, in this case, we've got on the left, uh, Department of Human Services and then Department of Education. And then this nebulous idea here that actually got its origins here in Sacramento, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, about how do we go ahead and imbue trust and standards and communication into that in a way that we could interact with the feds, we can interact with each other, and we could start getting, because what are we really talking about when we're talking about a longitudinal data system? We're basically talking about building a business intelligence platform or an analytics platform on top of all that information, okay? That's what we're really trying to get is to get to the answers, but how do you go ahead and architect this? So here's another example that uh, this is HIE, but it could just as easily be HIX, uh, whether it's information exchanges or insurance exchanges. If it looks like an iChart, it's supposed to. This was an early grab from way back when, 2009, with the ARRA of somebody, uh, a co-worker of mine, who said, I'm basically going to try and put together a conceptual diagram that would give a pictorial idea of what's involved with the, the health information exchange. 
So we got local practitioners, we got specialty clinics, we got people that are actually providing health care, we got guys out you know, in, in rural areas, we have physician payers, we've got uh, all the clearing houses for our medical billing and all this other stuff. These are the sort of problems we're being asked to solve in public sector right now. So when you think again about two, can, two tin cans and a piece of string, that approach will no longer scale. And it's something that even from the participation perspective, from applying for the grant perspective, the funding agency knows it won't scale to. So I'll tell you one of the reasons I first started getting heavily involved in this was back when we went to this architecture and talking about SLEDS grants for certain states, people were telling me we got denied. What's that all about? Well, what it's all about is, is there has to be a long-term requirements plan that goes beyond just what we were talking about here. There has to be a strategic security plan, which back in 2009, in my humble opinion, when you talk to most states that were applying to these individual grants as individual agencies, uh, when it came to a security plan, it would be a best efforts, appropriate efforts, the best that we can afford sort of stuff. It didn't map to anything. Well, when we started to see in 2009 with the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, and there was, I think, the first chunk of change was $193 billion for HHS development. If you wanted to participate or receive on, under any of those grants, you needed a strategic security plan filed with the National Coordination, Coordinator for Health Information Technology that, at the time, it might not have been spelled out, but now it's relatively clear what it is. It needs to map to what the feds use, which is some version of the NIST risk management framework. So moving right along, it's not the only place that we see it is in you know, uh, P20 for SLEDS grants and those sorts of things. It's not just in health and human services. We also see it uh, justice and public safety. Anybody who does eligibility determinations, anyone in the room? Uh, some of these handling considerations go along with federal tax information, that sort of stuff. And there's already an architecture that's been cooked out that the feds have had to use, but the question becomes, how do we do this on the state and local perspective? And let's not forget uh, if anybody interacts with any of these. And uh, one thing, with all due respect, I'll bid adieu to RSS. Uh, that was a while back. Uh, but primarily, how many people in the room have to have some aspect of what you're providing in terms of citizen services, or even for our own internal employees, that touches on some aspect that's going to be mobile platform specific, that's going to be uh, any one of these social networking site specific, 311, interaction with that. Anyone? Anyone want to take? It's, this is the new keeping the lights on. So this is the bad news. The bad news is, is that they give us less money, they give us more constraints, they make it even, you know, you always talk about that notion of the carrot and the stick. Well, they just put the carrot even further out and there's more stuff you have to do to go and get it. But at the same time, let's be honest, from a millennial's perspective, the people that are, you know, this growing portion of our constituency, if you're not interacting with them on something that either they can get through SMS or it doesn't have an I in front of it for the platform, if it's not iOS and it doesn't end in Droid and we don't have to worry about berries anymore but they might get acquired by somebody or something, it doesn't exist. Because this is the new platform for service deliveries is that we're gonna have to be agile, we're gonna have to be able to scale these things out to all these different means of delivering this to the right people at the right time in the right format. So what do we really have here when we talk about those four walls? We've got limits against a bunch of different business perspectives. So one of the things that we came here to talk about is interoperability. How are we going to get it into all those different platforms? How are we going to share this with our, our different business partners? Um, the SLEDS example is a great one. Answers that require interaction. It's not enough to just go and pull this from a static place. In a lot of cases, we're being asked to answer questions now and interact with people. We don't have those answers handy. We don't have that information on the tip of our tongue, so we need an interchange. We need a way to go ahead and, and, and create that. Um, there's a notion that transparency should underpin all this. We talk about transparency in government, and there's, there's whole different notions I could go into about that, things that involve what we're finding out NSA has been doing and those sorts of things. It's a different kind of transparency. But the idea for state and local government is, is we're being asked for more accountability, where we're spending our money, what we're doing with our time, that sort of stuff. Um, this is an avenue to that. One-stop shop, I love this term, because one-stop shop should be that idea of what we wanted to achieve, why Nirvana used to be that state portal, right? We wanted one place, and the reason why we considered it broken when the second service enrolled was because what we ended up with was Internet 1.0. Remember when it used to go to a, turn on Gopher and Winsock, and you would go to a website, and it was just a, bunch, a link list of a bunch of HTML stuff that would break every you know, 36 hours because somebody moved this or changed that? That's what we ended up with. 
because the idea isn't if I go there to see about whether or not I can get a permit for desolation wilderness for the weekend or something like that, but at the same time I remember I have a parking ticket to pay, if I have to re-authenticate, if I have to go in and log in again and it's just this whole, it's just one place to go for all the different places I have to log in, we haven't really solved anything. It may be prettier and it may be one URL to start with, but all that stuff, the URL should become transparent in the way that it operates anyways. Um, and then I, I, again, stealing another one, that one-stop shop is single view. I, I want to know that I'm not only, uh, when I think about Paul Laurent, it's important to me to know that, and I can tell you a true story about this one, uh, it's important to know that how many cars I own, it's important to know uh, where I work, it's important to know that I've paid my taxes, it's important to know that I'm not a deadbeat dad, I don't have a bond forfeiture warrant out for my arrest. At the same time, I, this is a true story, uh, the first time I ever did a jury trial in Chicago, I stood up and I said, Your Honor for the State, Paul Laurent, L-A-U-R-E-N-T, goes over to the Public Defender's Office, Your Honor for the Cook County Public Defender's Office, Paul Laurent, L-A-U-R-E-N-T. <laughs> Two guys, same courtroom, definitely different sides of the aisle. It might be kind of important to make sure we have the right Paul Laurent in this particular case. That's another thing. It's not enough to have a single view. That view has to be correct. We'll delve into that a little bit too. Uh, I talk about liberating things and, and stealing stuff uh, online versus inline. I think this was actually when Terry Takai was with Michigan. Uh, but there were statistics. I, I know AMBA published an old poll that said for every person that comes into a brick and mortar shop, it costs us $8 to go ahead and renew their driver's license. If they're eligible and they can do it online, it costs us $1 to go ahead and do it that way. Those are the operational efficiencies that we'd be after, right? So getting people online instead of standing in line. Mobile social cloud, I'm going to put them all into one bucket because the new challenge is there. This is really an interoperability issue. It's the whole idea of, look, if we're talking about mobile, I want to get it to the right platform, but it's got to work with what we've already architected. We don't always traditionally in public sector have the most agile and nimble systems to work with. Uh, again, picking on my home county, Cook County, Illinois, must be like the largest, you know, legacy mainframe customer in the entire, you know, planet. Um, but, but the idea is, is that those are not very flexible systems. They tend to break. They're not meant to talk to outside systems. They're not meant to embrace, embrace things like social networking. That's not what the mainframe at the Cook County DMV was designed to do or Secretary of State. Uh, but social is another extension of that. Cloud's an interesting one too. And, and this may be a little bit of an editorial. I don't hear much about public cloud in public sector. Uh, the reason being is that, you know, sometimes I'll get ribbing from guys on the, you know, private sector side of the house at Oracle that'll tell me, well, you guys don't have regulations like we do on private sector. And I'll say, that's right. We actually enforce ours. Because everybody told me in 2002 how Sarbanes Oxley was going to grind every, every publicly traded corporation to a screeching halt and that it would crash the stock market and kill everything. Um, how many people have heard the term too big to fail? How many people know that Societe Generale ended up with seven billion in positions out there because everybody trading uses the same password? Uh, and there's like the chase whale and so on and so forth. We actually enforce our regs. And you guys are no stranger to it here in the state of California. You continue to be on the cutting edge breach notification law. Just recently we got another law about do not track information and identity attributes that are going behind websites. Continue to change this. So you guys are asked to scale up to this tip of the spear for public sector as the people in the state of California would be the first ones to roll that out. So you guys definitely are, are familiar with what these new challenges mean to us. Now I know some of you, uh, I get this question a lot, what about my ROI? ROI? No. We're public sector, we don't turn a profit. It's risk of incarceration in public sector. In public sector, the worst days for us start with your agency or your name in the paper and somebody showing up with, <laughs> with cameras. <laughs> so uh, the most popular ones here, anybody raise your hand if any of these apply to you, HIPAA, High Tech, FERPA, Free and Reduced Lunches Act, State Reach Notification Law should hit all of you, but I'm giving you a pass. Nobody has to sit, raise their hand for that. Uh, we always have very specific individual care things. CGIS, no exemption for their IRS 1075. Boy, the SCISM team has been very busy. Anybody get a nice visit from them recently? I imagine FTV has probably been on their radar for a long time, but the SCISM team is the... Uh, uh, Safeguards Computer Security Evaluation Matrix team. It's basically a couple people from federal IRS and then a legion of people from Booz Allen come in and uh, they're basically people auditing for federal tax information controls. And they've been very active of late and they're doing a good job. Uh, but it's kind of like HIPAA. Anybody know when HIPAA was passed? 
1996. That's right. You know when the first audit was? Um, not too recent. Yeah, recent. 2007. So I think it was uh, Piedmont Hospital in Atlanta. Oh. So kind of like what they did with HIPAA, for those of you with federal tax information, your 11 years are up. So they're, they're coming in and they're basically auditing for that information here. So when we talk about this stuff, when we talk about building these services, we have a challenge that nobody else that deals with public cloud or hybrid cloud or any other engagement model really has the challenge of. We have some of the most stringent compliance requirements in existence, and we actually enforce them. So where does that leave us? Well, you're going, well, Paul, this sounds like a lot of bad news. <laughs> you're really not providing me much, with much help here, but here's the good news. Now, now we're going to start talking about what we've learned and how we're adjusting FHIR for this. How many people are familiar with FICAM? Got a couple hands. Federal Identity Credential Access Management. Um, yes, the first word was federal. Uh, and what's the joke? I'm here from the government. I'm here to help. In this case, they actually are. This is going to be hard because I have to stay in the hash marks. Normally, I'd be pointing out here. But let's do this like the hands of a clock, right? So there's a couple things that are common for every public sector organization. This includes federal as well as state and local. Um, at the end of the day, this represents all of our enterprises. And there's data back there that we need to keep the lights on to provide services, to keep people safe, to do all sorts of good stuff like that. But there's a couple elements around that. At the 12 o'clock position, we have identities. We have either constituents that need to interact with that data or our internal employees or our business partners that we're going to go ahead and give identities. We're going to identify who they are and determine whether or not they can access that data. We determine, so when we do that, we have the identity, we recognize it. If we go to the 9 o'clock position, the way that we make sure we can remember who this person is and whether or not they're, they're going to be able to come in through the door, we give them a credential. We give them something. Username, password. Anybody here holding on to like key fob, key token, smart card, stuff like that? Yeah? I'm sure just about everybody in here has something like that. So we got username, passwords. We got two-factor authentication. Sometimes we do stuff, you know, you think about this when you do it with uh, your phone or PayPal, things like that. Sometimes you're going to operate through other things. We're going to use mobile technology to go ahead. Those are all credentials. Those are all ways we know we can come back to identifying whether or not this person is tied to this identity and we can make a decision. Where we make that decision is at about 3.45, 4 o'clock here. We've got access management. So access management is a point where we make a decision and we say, hey, I've got a lot of pretty sensitive regulated data here on the back end. This is the point where I make the decision when I look at the credential that tells me who the identity is and I say, authorized or not authorized? Can I let you in the door? Can you touch the free and reduced lunches information at my local school? Can you see the health records for this stuff? Can you see whether or not this is a bad guy or not? Can you see the confidential informant information? Well, here's the problem with that, and I think the feds were the first to realize this. You cannot go and say, we're going to force everybody to standardize on one particular element across any of the three things, credentials, identities, or access. We can't force people to standardize on that because just like in the federal space, just like at Cook County, they have lots of old, brittle systems. Some are on the mainframe. Some are very modern, but most aren't. And if we tear that out, I had a, an, English, an English teacher back in high school who said, if you, if you pull that dangling participle or whatever off, it's going to bleed all over the page. Same sort of idea. It's going to be messy. Things are going to break. We're going to have lots of problems. What the feds figured out was, if there's one place where we can allow you to still keep the lights on, this is the primary stuff you need to approach, it's at the point where we talk to each other. They basically looked at this and said, you know those two tin cans with a string between it? What if we turn that into something like an OC line, right? What if we standardize this in a way that would be secure, that would be fast, that would be interoperable, where we could allow you to do all sorts of stuff on the back end, but this is the part where we make the differences. This is the part where we go ahead and say that we can standardize on this. And as long as we, say, we stick to open standards and we stick to things that are clearly identified and that everybody can play with, regardless of vendor, regardless of what they're running on the back end, can't that happen? Well, that's where FICAM came from. It was this idea of that identity credential access management and mandating that stuff for federal services. Well, you get a couple of people as you were going through this process here, and you could probably already feel this in the room if you're just thinking about this. Um, the guys that build energy weapons and other people that do things that are related to homeland security and you know, criminal justice and stuff like that are going, I'm a little bit different than US Postal Service. Or we got different security needs than the guys over at you know, fisheries, right? Or Bureau of Printing and, 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 and things like that. 
So the problem became, this has got to scale for different security needs too. So the question they were really asking is they said, so, so how much trust do we really have to have for any of this to work? And that's the beautiful part about this. Became like, uh, boy, I could really date myself, but this even predates me. You remember slide rules? Uh, nobody has to admit to that. But, <laughs> but the idea is, is that if we determine that what we're dealing with is information that is bad guy data or how you build a rail gun or something like that, um, then that's going to go up to a higher level than, say, if you just want to know if national parks are open this week. Spoiler alert, they're not. But the point is, is that we're going ahead and we're going to say, as we go through these different levels, it could be that we could just take username password for this. If all it is is that I want a context for every time somebody comes back to that national parks and they're looking for, I want trail information because I'm going to go and, you know, it's funny, as much as I fly, I don't get to camp or do any of this stuff, but it sounds like you could tell what I'm after. Um, if all I want is trail information, then I can have a customized look feel. It's going to be a my approach to every time I come back in there, I log in and I get it. But if at the same time we're saying, I need to get onto a super secure network and I need to check things and see if this guy is the same Paul Laurent that has you know, a bond forfeiture warrant out for his arrest, then we need to protect that in a different way. So it could be those key fobs, those key, key, key tokens that here at six o'clock, these uh, smart cards. The reason why I don't refer to this as a CAC card, we talked about this in the middle. Anybody in the room have one? Occasionally good, you haven't got a couple of people? All right, the common access credential. Uh, that whole notion that they use this in DOD, but we also have this now for every federal employee, a federal executive employee, and a, every federal executive contractor. Why, what you see on this bottom line here is that PIVI compliant, and we've gotten a couple new standards for that. I tell you to go look them up, but right now I don't know if you can. Get to that in a second too. Uh, uh, personal identity verification, and that's standard one. This is something that's meant to be rolled out to civilian populations. And we see some states doing some uptake with this. And I know there's certain projects. Anybody doing this in the state of California? Because we hear discussions about it on the NASIO calls. So that's another thing. I participate in uh, NASIO Digital Identity Working Group and NSTIC. Anybody here NSTIC? Oh, we got to do a better job. One person at least. Thank you. So NSTIC is a national strategy for trusted identities in cyberspace. And we'll, we'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit too. Boy, I'll leave myself some time here. Uh, so why not FICAM? Well, the feds have four walls that are different. They can budget for one of these projects. They can say by legislative fiat, this is in your charter and you're going to develop these standards and you will follow this under penalty of whatever and so forth. And we're building communication. So for them, it's real easy. But of course, the main thing is, is they took all of our tax dollars and contributed to building these standards. Uh, NIST, familiar with NIST? National Institute for Standards and Technology. I would argue they write the best computer security and computer interoperability standards on the planet. It's open to debate. If anybody wants to debate it, save time afterwards. Uh, but we've been chipping away at this. They've been spending all the way going back to the Government Paperwork Elimination Act of 1998. They've been spending all our dollars building this framework out. So then the challenge became, how do we do this for states knowing that we have four different walls than they do? Well, that's where we come to Sacramento in August of 2010. So uh, heavily involved in NASIO, the Digital Identity Working Group, uh, a lot of these guys have moved on. Mark Weatherford, Lee Mossbrucker, right? Uh, there were a couple of questions, Mike Lukaitis. Uh, a couple of the questions were, we'd like to develop something like FICAM, but we'd like to develop it for the states. I was perplexed, so we were contacted, a couple guys on my team and uh, at, at Oracle and at a couple other vendors. We were invited to come in and start taking a stab at writing the first standard for Identity Federation, uh, just a rough draft. They did all the heavy lifting. We just threw the first 70, 80 pages at them and uh, talk about, well, how do we do this differently for the states? And I was perplexed because, you know, here I am trash talking the state of Illinois. Of course, when I go to the state of Illinois, I'll trash talk some other state. California was always my poster child for the state that could never do centralized services. Because let's face it, there are departments in California that get more federal dollars than entire state IT budgets. Um, what that equates to is a knife fight. So every time somebody wants to tell you, you will do things this way, and there's a federal requirement tied to the back of it, or there's money tied to the back of it, odds are it's going to be a tough road to move somebody from one path to another. So I was curious. So this is coming from California? Here's why. Whatever has to work, if this was going to be the architecture for going forward, it had to support something that wasn't, it couldn't just exclusively be a big centralized trust authority in the middle of this. 
it had to be malleable enough to support things like uh, kind of like the notion of old service bureaus. The idea of these people handle this sphere of influence, these handle this sphere of influence, and they provide services out to constituent agencies, even though they may all be organized underneath the state. So we took a crack at that. Uh, main idea, I don't know why I need a slide to explain this. I'm pretty sure everybody here can glean this between F, Phi, Cam, S, Psi, Cam, right? The idea was is that we were basically going to try and architect this, leveraging the same sort of standards, but that we were going to put this into a different perspective where states could actually use this and we weren't just going to hit the first wall of budget and charter and say we're done. So uh, this came out. This is on the NACIO Publications website. You can go ahead and grab this. It's in its second rev right now. Uh, good reading. So all the things that I'm talking about here, obviously every circumstance for every enterprise in the room is going to have different realities that they have to deal with different critical data, different service interfaces, different constituencies, and different compliance requirements. This will help you get to what the specifics of that are. I'm not going to get into all the specifics. Again, we're going to talk more about that layer eight and how you help sell this and get other people interested in going ahead and participating on a voluntary basis. Because some of the programmatic and grant requirements we have, if you have a better way to approach this, let me know and I'll steal it. But I've been to just about every state in the union, and I haven't seen a better way to do it. This is the closest you're going to come. Uh, I'm about 10 minutes out, so I'm going to start rolling ahead. Um, this eye chart was not meant to be read except for the, the primary headings here. What are our primary goals here? We want to increase trust, interoperability, security, and we start, get, we start getting operational efficiencies and do process improvements on the back end. If that's not the objective, I assume that's why most people decided they wanted to come and take a look after reading the abstract and see this session. This is the objective stated in SciCam. This is a direct pull right out of the document. So what did we have before? When we had the four-wall agency view, and where do we start with this whole thing? One of the problems we had was when we started talking about services, it wasn't just as complex as saying, uh, well, I got different people, different services, like our state portal thing. Even within an individual agency or department that you're interacting with, each system sees you differently. So you can be an employee, but you can also be a driver. You can also be a student. You can be all these different things. If we tie you to the back-end services, we start getting this hodgepodge. What we're really after doing here is basically on a services delivery perspective, being able to derive what's that single view. So you're all probably familiar and probably can't read any of this because of the contrast. Identity proofing, authentication, risk management, fraud detection, federation, data classification. These are all very nice things that go behind our identity management projects and things that we attempt to do in the long run. What we're trying to get at with SciCam is a little bit different. We're trying to get to two major they would be superset categories of this. We want identity assurance. So the idea that you are who you say you are, I'm not going to worry about authorization. I'll explain that in a second. I just want to make sure that the citizen, the individual, the employee, whoever it is that I'm talking to here within the state is who they say they are. I want to be assured of that. I want to have some sort of demarcation. Just like if you're postal service, you're different than the guys at Sandia or Los Alamos National Labs. I want to have a different level of assurance for that and know what that level is and then I want to be able to propagate it. That's the problem we ran into at portals. It was so difficult to get that identity to be reusable in a different context. And the key, the key now with all these different things, we tar start talking about mobile, social, cloud, identity context is everything when it comes to security and interoperability. So what we're trying to do, and this is just a conceptual idea, is no matter who you are, when we break out these different assurance levels, we should have one single view of you, and then it's the service, it's what you're trying to hit on the back end that determines whether or not we're in alignment with that. So what you're looking at right here, this is what we would call a component architecture model. It's not actually architectural, it's not logical, but if you talk about what are the six pieces that make up SciCam, and I'll basically explain them. Uh, we have master data management, which is not necessarily a product. It can be a product, but it's mostly a discipline. Uh, master data management primarily starts when we talk about inventories, but in this case, our inventory is our citizens, our individuals, the people that we're servicing. Um, if you look at the specs, 70% of it is service-oriented architecture. It's the standards that make all this stuff hook into each other and connect. Uh, we have identities. Uh, we may provide access. We're definitely providing authentication, but we have the credentials that go with it. Uh, we have a portal interface because we need a way to, to, to basically look at it. That's going to be our bridge to mobile. Uh, because then if we basically architect it in a way where we can hit it through HTML or some offshoot of that, then we don't care what the platform you're attempting to hit it from is. And then the reason business intelligence is included here is because from a programmatic perspective, we're asked to come up with those BI-facing questions. 
answer a slides question for me. From an HIE, HIX perspective, tell me what's going on with these particular programs. So it's basically a reporting platform on top of it, but it's, it's not really integral to what we're talking about on the, uh, on the plumbing level of it. Um, let's talk about the identity side of this and the master data management side of this. This is generally where people really start to get interested because it's, it gets at the problems that we're really wrestling with. What's in an identity? Well, if you read down this list, there's a, a lot of different ways that an individual can be viewed by the state. And there's a lot of different ways that they may want to consume services. This is not all from the standpoint of just, uh, yes, it could be fraud reduction. Yes, it could be data quality on top of identity. But at the same level, we're also here to provide services. So what if it turns out uh, you're on unemployment right now and there's a new job training thing that's in your area. It hits with some of the things that you've identified as part of what you've been going through your, through your unemployment process. What if there's a new service that I could have extended to you? If you have a child that basically could have taken advantage of another program that we've put out there, it can help put people in touch with that. It can also keep me from basically sending, uh, we're gonna send checks, welfare checks for lack of a better term, to a known bad address, or we're sending five to the same person even though they're going to different places. So we get it both on the fraud reduction side and operational efficiency side, as well as we're gonna increase the viability and the efficaciousness of the services that we're providing. But we can't get to that until we have that single view. We have to understand all the different ways that we can take a look at this and what's in those identities. Uh, this goes all the way back to a Forrester study from many, many years ago, but I love this. They basically said there were nine common systems that every state central IT had in place. No two of those nine systems track username ID uh, the same way. That's part of the legacy problem in the way we used to do this. What we're trying to do is put a layer on top of that, uh, and this is, again, I'm, I, I'm, I'm running a little bit short on time, so I'm gonna blow through this, that data changes. So part of what we're trying to do is not only to put the connectivity between that, but we're also trying to put, uh, we're also trying to put a data quality on top of identity. Uh, I gave you my example from when I was with the, uh, the prosecutor's office, that whole idea of do I have the right person. Where does that live? How we start talking about that is, is basically this idea of, uh, this is what, back when we were working on this in 2010, was coined in SciChem as a state identity and business data validator. Business data is because we may not only be talking about individuals, we could also be talking about businesses, we could be talking about business partners. Uh, the notion inside a, a flow like this is that every time we have a contact, we're gonna go ahead with that citizen or with that business and have a repository that basically just provides a join. It's a primary foreign key relationship between, uh, between agency one and agency two. We're not building a superset of your data we're not keeping sensitive information in there. If it's architected perfectly, ideally, even if that data went out from a best practices perspective, we would still say that, dear citizen, we regret to inform you, your data was lost in alignment with the state breach, but you should basically architect that where no breachable information is actually included in there. So what are we getting at when we talk about this? We're talking about the most complete, most accurate, and most up-to-date picture of who you told the state you were. We're not out there trolling for new information. We're not holding on to any sensitive information. If your state department of education, your child student performance data, that's why we leave authorization on the back end, stays there. All we're answering here from this business validator perspective is who are you? Who'd you say you were? And it's only from context that you already have with the state anyway. So we're not going down a, a, a privacy rat hole and going and looking for new information on people. We're not doing things, and I, I get this question a lot. Well, isn't this just like creating a, uh, a social security number, though, then that operates at the state? Uh, anybody ever hear of the concept of acronym MBUN? Meaningless but unique number or string? What we're really looking to do here is just provide something that if it's intercepted, nobody could use it. It's not like social security number because we not only use social security number with credit agencies and with financial agencies, we not only use that for authorization in some, or authentication, in some cases we actually used it for authorization. That was part of the problem we went down with, with social security number. If you intercepted it, nobody would be able to do anything with it. It's a meaningless but unique number of string. But for you on the back end and for state services, it tells me, it gives me a context that, hey, you're Paul the prosecutor, you're not Paul the public defender. It tells me that you have these unpaid parking tickets and that there may be another additional unemployment service that you could use, that sort of thing. And the way that you do this, jumping ahead is, and I know we're running very short on time, but the way that you go ahead and do this is that you don't boil the ocean here. You don't actually start at the idea of building a trust authority, you start with one handoff. 
The first time I ever did this with a state, there was a question here, basically, and we'll just pick two different departments, where they said, uh, the question was, well, what's the first thing you want to stand up in this, in, in this infrastructure? The first thing they wanted to do was they basically said, every time that we're going to look at these student records, due to this particular statute, we have to have uh, parental permission to go ahead and aggregate that data by virtue of state law. All I want to do is check over with DHS. Just tell me, binary, true, false, do they have parental permission to do this before I can aggregate it into this business reporting platform? All it was was one service call. You build it out using standards, open standards, and you can see there's a lot of so in here. But uh, yeah, uh, you can look at any of those standards on the NIST website any week, but this week. Uh, so because they're actually down, they took the website down. One standard, say we're going to go ahead and do one handoff, tell me binary, true or false, do we have permission for this? Once you cook that handoff, we now have a context for those two agencies, for that individual that we were discussing, and we now have a primary foreign key relationship. So we can say this person is the right Jane Doe from this person to this person. When we talk about it, so what's the information we're handing off? The second thing they wanted to do was they had some check where before we can share this information, we need to know if this person exists in the state HIV database. Heavily regulated information. If we're talking about parental consent for some things, that's where we start talking about what's the level we need here. Level two, level three. When we start to get an HIV, we de determine that that's going to be a higher level. So the security standards are there in 863. This is the sliding scale. So the interoperability is all built off of the same standards. We find these things through like NEEM, National Information Exchange Model. Uh, if you're doing authentication, anybody in justice and public safety? GFIPM, ever, ever hear that one? Global Federated Identity Privilege Management. If you want to play with the feds, FBI, DHS, they have a certain set of attributes that you have to knock on their door before they'll let you play in law enforcement online or Homeland Security Information Network. That's what this interacts with. So when we, when we review this and we start talking about how you would architect this stuff out, we need standards. We start small, start with one handoff and start building a services catalog. One of the most common things every state has, uh, verify driver's license, right? That's something that would absolutely be in your services catalog, right? When we do the handoff, we're going to make a determination of how sensitive is the system on the back end. That's going to tell me what level of NIST 863 that I could apply. And there's a large sliding scale, a whole panoply that you can, you can work with there. We're going to take something that doesn't violate anybody's privacy and wouldn't be meaningful to anybody if they intercepted it to go ahead and give that primary foreign key relationship. And then all the handoffs we use to talk to each other, our communication protocols for both authentication and the way that we're going to do data exchange are going to be standards based. <coughs> doesn't matter what your vendor backend is. As long as you can play in open standards, you can communicate with other agencies, that highway that you just built can be used by anybody else in the state. And well, by the way, it's also interoperable with the feds. And all this will also match up with your compliance requirements. It had to be architected to do things like HIPAA, FERPA, CGIS, IRS 1075. So as you can probably tell, this was a lot to try and pack into 45 minutes. I'm hoping I whetted your appetite. We're going to be around. We have a table there to just start and talk discussing about how you do this from an architectural perspective. I would definitely suggest you go ahead and check out the NASIO website, which is still open, uh, and go ahead and download the SICAM publication there. A lot of it was based on the idea and the notions of serving from that distributed service model, a state just like California, because it was your innovators and it was your leadership that started it. Definitely check that out. Uh, I'll leave it open for questions, but I'm probably taking you guys over time. If anybody wants to stick around and throw those out, I'll take them. I have cards here as well. Uh, thanks for your time, but I, I know I've run over, so my apologies. Uh, anyone?